Welcome to part one of I Beat Every Non-GTA Rockstar Game. Why am I covering this, you might ask? Well, Rockstar Games is by far my favorite video game publisher and developer. I've always thought they've been one of the most consistent gaming companies in terms of quality and feel. I love Rockstar so much because they're responsible for some of my favorite games ever, many considered some of the best of all time. Most of them contain the same similar feeling mechanics, quirky writing, unique worlds, one-of-a-kind characters, I mean, there's truly no other games like these. Not every game contains that rock star feel, but I thought it would be fun to play and beat every game either published and or developed by them to see which ones did. Now to educate you on what the publisher does versus what a developer does, the developer is in charge of the actual game creation, the 3D modeling, the coding, the art design, while the publisher is in charge of distribution, promotion, fun funding, and marketing. In the beginning, Rockstar Games was just known as a publisher, while several small studios were in charge of the actual game development. Throughout their evolution as a company, Rockstar started absorbing almost all of those small developers and split them into branches of the Rockstar Company, such as Rockstar North, Rockstar San Diego, Rockstar Vancouver, Rockstar Canada, etc, etc. Thus, the newer games, they are the publisher and developer. All those branching studios and Rockstar as a whole are one big subsidiary of Take-Two Interactive, a holding company that is most known for controlling Rockstar games and 2K. Yikes! Most know Rockstar for the Red Dead, Midnight Club, Max Payne, Manhunt games, and especially their pioneering franchise Grand Theft Auto, which will not be discussed in this series because, first, everyone knows them and the other games don't get enough love, especially the obscure ones. Second is they're very long and hard to complete. And third, they're a video on their own. What will be covered in this three-part series is the 30 non-GTA Rockstar games. Rules for the series include the game needs to either be published or developed by Rockstar Games. I am not including the developers games who were absorbed into the Rockstar company, even DMA Design who was the original developer that grew into Rockstar. Again, that's a video on its own. Also, not all Take-Two games are counting either. A lot of games are in the tricky middle ground, just know what's required for this video is the classic yellow logo. The order I play and discuss these games in this series is based off the original Rockstar published release, despite which version I play. Some of these games have had ports made years after the originals, even with some different developers and publishers. Not so much for this video, but know that I will always play the most complete edition, the most content-packed version of each game. I will state which version I play so you can be aware of any discrepancies. Beating the game means I play the entire story mode and all available missions. I'll dabble in the other modes in order to cover the whole game, but just know I'm not 100%ing these. If given a difficulty option, I will always choose normal slash standard slash medium. And to repeat, no GTAs will be discussed. At the end of each game, I will give an out of 10 difficulty rating and an out of 10 fun factor rating. And at the end of the series, I will pick my top 10 favorites. Anyway, let's start this 30 game marathon off. Now, I know what you're thinking. Is this technically a Rockstar game? Yeah, strangely it is. The game feels nothing like one, which is the case for several of today's games. Monster Truck Madness 64, released in 1999, is actually just a port of Monster Truck Madness 2 for the PC released a year earlier. The game's developer was Edge of Reality, a now defunct studio that was known for a lot of ports and several really forgettable games. Everything about the game off the bat gave me bargain bin N64 vibes in the same vein of the N64 Maddens and wrestling games and honestly it lived up to that status. The game is essentially just a standard monster truck racing game as you'd expect while also containing a good amount of different modes. There's Exhibition which is just a split screen racing mode that allows for up to four players. Battle Games which interestingly contains low key the inspiration for Rocket League with its near identical soccer and hockey modes. People aren't talking about this enough. Look at this side by side. And there's other battle 
battle games such as the police chase mode, a weird chicken tag mode, and a king of the hill mode. And there's circuit, which is what I played, a mode comprised of 10 tracks that take place in a variety of locations where you race against three other computer trucks. Now I'm gonna say it right now, this game is hard as hell. One of the most brutally unfair, stressful, sweaty, honestly hardest and worst games I've ever played. Prepare for one hell of a rant. What made the game so hard can be broken down into several reasons. Map layout, glitches, terrible physics, and unfair difficulty enhancers. Like I said in the intro, I chose whatever the normal difficulty would be, but in order to have access to all 10 maps, you had to beat the game on expert. Every single map start to end. And let me tell you right now, this isn't your normal expert mode. No, no, no. This is way harder. Not only are you going against perfectionist bots, but as a difficulty enhancer, the lighting is dramatically changed. What I mean is a possible time of day for a map to take place in is night called pitch black, which three of the maps take place in. They were definitely some of the hardest. And also that fourth map, the heights, my God, the difficulty. This made things crazy, ridiculously harder. It's like a two foot render distance that forces you to perfectly memorize the map. You'll even find yourself using the goddamn police car purely for the additional visibility from the cop lights. Along with every turn memorized, you need to also memorize all the power-up locations and hit the correct ones. There were eight power-ups in total, some of which were extremely powerful, others not so much. They included the force field, which zapped nearby enemies, invisibility, which allowed you to clip their parts of the map and other drivers, oil slick, which dropped a slippery oil puddle that you'll most likely slip in instead of the intended bots, super jump, which gave you that, a super jump, homing missile, which gave you three powerful aimbot explosive missiles, shrink bombs, which are the equivalent to the lightning bolt in Mario Kart, nitro, which gave you a crazy speed boost, and hover, which gave you the ability to fly over the map for a bit. The power-ups of force field, homing missiles, and visibility and hover were goaded, essential items that made the game way more doable, some debatably overpowered. The others were occasionally useful, but too hard to control, especially the super jump in nitro. The hover was so nice, and the one I always aimed to get, but was annoying when I flew too high to trigger checkpoints. Also, it's strange here because the bots never end up using any of the items, but honestly, that just would have made things harder. The absolute sweat required on some of these maps is hard to put into words, especially the first map, Graveyard, which was in the dark, which was a rude wake-up call for expert. The amount of talent required is insane, extremely tactical gameplay. Like I said, the map layout here, not good. You will get lost so many times, not even just on the pitch black maps. There are countless unrelenting falls that guarantee a loss because the game doesn't respawn you. It expects you to navigate your way back onto the track. And the map is sort of infinite. Occasionally you'll fly off course and eventually end up on the polar opposite side of the map. There were a few cool shortcuts, but overall the main path was the safest. You will be restarting your game an innumerable amount of times because an expert, almost no mistakes are allowed. And if you add the amount of glitches you'll encounter into the equation, especially checkpoints, rip. The whole checkpoint system was completely broken. There were so many races where the place markers were totally off, blatantly incorrect. Correct. I even had to do an extra lap because of how the first, second, third, fourth positions always got screwed up. Plus the checkpoint posts were massive. I was nailing those left and right. Let's address the physics, the definition of clunky. I honestly think the only reason I was able to beat this game in a decent amount of time is by utilizing my Mario Kart 64 skills because these N64 racers have this really similar drifty feel that is very hard to get good at. What you can and can't clip through is a constant toss up. The control are mad frustrating. Just believe me when I say this game is incredibly hard and incredibly dog shit. Now part of me does like the bumper cars aspect of the game. The wonky physics do allow for some funny moments and extreme airtime with jumps. The physics are so wild that occasionally the enemy trucks will rocket off the map way off course forcing them to painstakingly return to the race. I also appreciate the wide range of camera angles available. Most are unusable but welcomed options. Also the surprisingly large roster of real monster trucks at your disposal was also a positive. And come on, the game has a button mapped solely for burping. That's pretty dope. <laughs> 
And with this being an N64 cartridge that doesn't save your progress, they give you codes to resume where you were previously, so I gotta respect that, even if they are long as hell. The announcer though, my god, does he force you to mute the TV. Him and the music are mad repetitive. The announcer constantly yells, CHECKPOINT! And has some really weird commentary lines. This could be an Olympic event in the year 2000. I'd lie if I said I didn't have any fun. I did occasionally because I was getting the controls down, like really down towards the end. And when you complete all 10 maps, you do get an insane sense of accomplishment, but this game just required too much sweat on expert. For the little it did good, the negatives way outweigh them. All in all, an embarrassing start for Rockstar. When it comes to a difficulty rating, I'd give Monster Truck Madness 64, honestly, a nine out of 10. Those pitch black stages and wonky physics really made it one of the hardest games I've ever played. When it comes to a fun factor rating, I'd give the game a 4 out of 10 because I do have some fond memories and winning did feel good. Earthworm Jim 3D from 1999, a decently well-known game, but not known for being a Rockstar title. It was developed again by another now defunct studio, this time VIS Interactive, whose catalog of games is rather uneventful besides a future Rockstar title. This game is not a fan favorite. After the success of the first two Earthworm Jim games, which I've played neither, was this N64 game that took the leap to 3D. It looks and plays nearly identical to the N64 for platformers of the time, but isn't remembered as well. The history behind the game makes a lot of sense. The studio who previously owned Earthworm Jim, Shiny Entertainment, sold the franchise to VIS with the rule of no sequels. Well, of course they ignored that and we got this. 3D is actually the last ever Earthworm Jim game, so it's safe to say VIS killed the franchise. Now, there are several reasons why it's disliked by fans. The humor is considered not as good as the previous games. The story is not liked because it's largely based off the show instead of the games, people have issues with the character designs, and most dislike the game for its jank camera, which trust me, we'll get into cause it's bad. Even the main Earthworm Jim dev from the first two claimed he hated this game. I was excited to play an entry in this series, but man, once I got into it, wow is it difficult. What makes it so hard is how poorly made it is. It looks pretty damn good, but underneath that game is unrelenting difficulty. The story's concept is kind of genius. The entire game takes place in Earthworm Jim's brain, split into four sections, memory, happiness, fantasy, and fear. Each of the sections has maps and characters that fit each of those themes. There are 15 stages in total, which mostly consist of platforming sections and boss battles at the end of each brain portion. For an N64 game, wow is it long. I progressed through it so slowly. And since the game is rather obscure, there isn't much info online about it at all, so it was hard to seek out help. And oh boy, will you need it. Let me break down what made the game so insanely difficult. Now, Earthworm Jim 3D works like this. Throughout the stages, you gather marbles and golden udders. There's 100 marbles and anywhere from 3 to 7 udders per stage. It's not clear at all all what amount of each you need to progress the game. That's one of my biggest issues is you basically have to 100% it. The amount of marbles and udders required to unlock the different brain sections and various levels required crazy high amounts of each item. When you reach the desired numbers, it tells you you're smart as a blank or clever as a blank, and it takes you a while to even understand what that means. It's such an overly harsh punishment to force players to replay entire levels to gain more marbles because because you have to gather as much as before and then get even more. And if you ever die, the entire level is reset. The crazy high item requirements led to countless frustrating moments. Add to that is the health system, which is a percentage out of 100, and a lives system, which altogether was very strange because you essentially get infinite lives. You can lose all your lives, but it doesn't really matter because all the marbles are reset regardless. But that low health percentage? Nah, that doesn't get reset, even if you beat a stage. And like I said with the camera, who is it? 
terrible, very hard to negotiate camera that just adds to the overall clunkiness of the controls. The camera got stuck under platforms constantly and or was locked in place and just made it hard to see where you were going 50% of the time. I could go on and on. I mean, any missions with lava were overly brutal. The boss battles were extremely tedious and legit copy and pastes of each other. Fall damage was an absolute health drainer. Certain ledges were hard as hell to clip onto. Parts of the game were legit frame fests, and you'll also encounter a good amount of glitches. A statue I had to activate refused to work, the super jump bean cans failed on me all the time, marble and utter counts were glitched and forced me to return to missions several times. Bro, the fifth and final level are enough to make you question ending things if you know what I mean. The game does have a lot of potential if they just fixed the camera, added some more checkpoints, and more clearly laid out how many items needed to be collected, I wouldn't be on rant mode. It would have been a thousand percent better game. Just know it's not a casual playthrough whatsoever, despite the cartoony childish look. For how much the game does terribly, there are a handful of redeeming qualities. The combat is well done, the infinite ammo is appreciated, the aiming is solid, the tiny ship companion was a nice feature, and the decapitating butcher knife was fun to use. I don't know how accurate the maps and characters are to the source material, but I really enjoyed their looks. The maps were all very different, vibrant, and charming. In one of the missions, there's brown water waterfalls coming from these outhouses, which, come on, that's pretty clever. The characters are all really great. I love the speaker guys, the hot sauce dude, the dabbing grandmas, the potatoes who looked like 90s Happy Meal toys, the fish that look like Klaus, and Larry the Cucumber's low-key brother. Plus, their dialogue was occasionally funny and quirky. There's just something about the art style I enjoyed. The retro 3D polygon look, it's my vibe. There's even a stage that looked like SpongeBob's house. Combine that with some banger songs on each stage and the ability to change the smell in the option menu makes you at least like the game a tad, despite all the negatives. Like Monster Truck Madness 64, I was getting good. It took me a while, but eventually I learned to cope with the bad controls and the jank camera. I was finessing areas towards the end. I was farming chickens for health, training the bunnies around, finding clutch glitch spots, and developing unique marble grabbing techniques. At the end of the day, the game is way too grindy to be fun. Some portions are incredible incredibly RNG, and the boss battles sucked ass. Honestly, the whole thing was a low point for me. I dreaded returning to this game day after day. I really built a dislike towards it. So when it comes to difficulty rating, I'm dropping a fat 10 out of 10 because nothing is harder than bad controls and a bad camera. That in some truly brutal stages and boss battles. And for its fun factor rating, it's getting a 2 out of 10. Too stressful to be fun, and at the end of my 24 plus hour playtime, it felt like a real waste of time. Finally, we've gotten to a legitimate good game. Still, hard as hell, but really solid, unique, and dare I say, fun. This is the start of games you might start to recognize, games that start to feel rockstar. Thrasher Presents Skate Destroy is an interesting game because of how people view it today. People see PS1 skating game and assume Tony Hawk clone, but if you check the release dates, Tony Hawk released only a single month before, so Thrasher is one of the few games to not be influenced by the now dominating skating series. With that being said, this game is real slept on. It's quite good. Skate & Destroy released in 1999 for the US and later in 2000 in Japan under a different name. For the US version, the developer responsible is again another now defunct studio, this time Z-Axis, who isn't too known for anything besides this, a Guitar Hero, BMX XXX, and a cancelled Call of Duty game. Skate & Destroy is a simulation style skating game that doesn't walk you through anything. That's not necessarily a bad thing, just know there's a very steep learning curve. People deem it one of the most realistic skating games ever. Some prefer it to Tony Hawk because of its very technical nature. There are six different characters available, each with slightly different stats. There are 12 stages and each has progressively bigger score requirements. Points are achieved by pulling off tricks either on flat ground, on rails, or mid-air when hitting ramps. The levels either take place on the street or in a contest setting. On the street levels, at the end, 
and you will be chased by a cop, thug, or a dog. Or if you reach the desired score early, you can choose to exit the map before the chase. On the contest levels, instead of a chase, there's a 500 point judge penalty when you fail a trick. The game rewards you for pulling off as many different tricks in as many different areas as possible. Skate areas can even be destroyed when too much time is spent at it. The goal of the game is to eventually become pro, and that is achieved once you finish all the stages. Once you complete the game, expert mode becomes available and adds the cool ability to replay your mission, take a screenshot, and use that for a Thrasher magazine cover, which I think is a really dope feature. I never got to do it because I just beat the 12 stages on regular. Every time you beat a stage, you unlock new tricks, which will be needed to reach the increasing score requirements. Throughout the game, you can select sponsors that give you new boards and new clothes, and one of the sponsors being that supreme baby, but you know I had to choose that Santa Cruz. There's also a health bar that displays how close your board is to breaking. You also have to make sure to not take too much damage yourself, which can also end a level. Later game, there's even dangerous obstacles to avoid that add even more difficulty. There's so much to love here. The several multiplayer modes, the infinite free skate at the beginning of each stage, the hilarious ragdoll physics, which this is considered one of the first games to include them. Also, Skate Destroy runs pretty smooth for a PS1 game and surprisingly looks pretty good as well. And bro, the soundtrack? Fire! Packed with hip-hop classics. And like I mentioned earlier with the first-person cop taser chase, such a unique idea. You have to keep skating in this far away second-person perspective where you get a three times trick multiplier, which that allowed me to pass several of these missions. Now this game is great and fun, but hard. How quickly you get good and beat it all depends on your memory. You have to learn the tricks. There's no way around it. I practiced so much until something clicked and I eventually got decent. Your muscle memory eventually takes over and you do what I call educated button smashing where your hands just start inputting combos nonstop. These combo based games require legitimate skill. Around halfway through the game, there's a dramatic difficulty shift. I was struggling so much that I tried to use a combo cheat sheet that I made but that was no use. I had to get good the old-fashioned way. Memorization. I was grinding combos for so long that I went brain dead and educated button smashed my way through an entire stage first try. Occasionally later missions will be easier than previous ones, but just know the end game is no joke. This game really reminded me of another really slept on combo based game, Free Running for the Wii. You should check that out as well. Now the only complaints I have is it can be a tad buggy, the wall bouncing and pinch points were frustrating, the music, although fire, can get repetitive, and my biggest issue is the lack of a restart button. That was majorly needed. Thrasher Presents Skate Destroy though is honestly a great well-paced game. There's something to say for how simple it is. It's just a skate spot and you performing tricks. That's it. And once you start to get good, it can be quite fun and satisfying. So when it comes to a difficulty rating, I'd say 8 out of 10. Not like before with the bad controls, just because of the skill mastery required to complete the game. For its fun factor, I'd say it's a 7 out of 10. There's really no other game like this that will give you this type of skating experience. This is definitely a Rockstar title worth checking out. Today's first Game Boy comes in the form of Evil Knievel from 1999, which according to some sources was released the same day as Thrasher, which according to some sources was released the same day as Earthworm Jim 3D, which I thought was crazy. Again, this is another real obscure boy. This is surprisingly one of the few Evil Knievel games that even exist. Does it do him justice? God no, it's terrible. The developer this time is Tarantula Studios, which interestingly enough, eventually morphed into the branching studio Rockstar Lincoln. This is again, another game with very little info on it online, so I really felt on my own when beating it. If you can't already tell, this is a game played on an emulator for your viewing pleasure. If you're wondering if I use the emulator save state feature, I did only as a time saver at the beginning of missions, never as a checkpoint. I got through the game completely legit. This was 
was still damn hard though. I mean, can we get one easy game? Jesus. To sum up Evil Knievel, it's a poorly made motocross game that's 20 levels long. The course either takes place outside or inside, which those were way more difficult. Each level has the simple goal of reaching a flag, and that's accomplished by traversing up and down obstacle-packed hills, all while not hitting your head or running out of gas. At the end of each of the four worlds, there's a grand finale mode where you need to pull off a jump over objects that you strangely get to decide. Similar to Monster Truck Madness 64, at the end of missions you're given codes to maintain your progress through the game, but you don't really need them because all the stages are available to play weirdly right off the bat. Similar to games like Excite Bike, Trials, or low-key hill climb racing, your controls consist of a button for acceleration and also controls for teetering back and forth. There's also a flip button, but that's really it. Where Evil Knievel starts to get ridiculous is there's not only a gas element to the game, but a bike health element as well that should not exist exist in my opinion. Walt Motocross game has those two features. There were countless times where I unfairly took damage, enough to where it ended runs. Even though I beat this almost entirely in one day, it's not an easy game. Some maps took hours. Where the game starts you is an impossible stage. I was mad struggling, then realized this is an optional practice level. So I said see you later to that one, then entered level one on the casino, and bruh, incredibly difficult. That alone took me three hours. So like I said, with uh, having the ability to play all the stages from the start, I just skipped the hard ones and returned to them later. A lot about this game pissed me off. You'll get stuck all the time. Some course designs made it confusing what was background, verse what wasn't there were so few checkpoints once your bike started going backwards you might as well restart you'll smash your head and it won't count but then other times out of nowhere a love tap will there's two game over screens which led me to use save states not to cheat just to cut the in-between bullcrap you essentially get infinite lives so it doesn't matter those quick saves led me to go through hundreds of retries quickly so bless up for them the game's design is poorly thought out part of me liked the obstacle course nature of the maps I mean that's what Evil Knievel did, dangerous stunts and jumps, but when going through the course, you don't see what's coming up. So the non-stop, in-your-way barrels seemed a tad unfair. They just served as straight-up momentum killers. When I eventually started honing it in, I was getting pretty good. Fun moments were had, but they were few and far between. Parts of the game made me sort of enjoy it. I mean, the mini-map was a nice feature. I wish I could see myself on it. Some of the maps were pretty unique and contained some cool visuals. Soundtrack did go a little hard. And similar to the previous games, the sense of accomplishment you feel when beating all the levels is satisfying. And the way the game lets you customize your bike is a respectable addition. I quickly realized you needed to jack all the stats all the way in hopes of glitching your way across giant portions of the map, which was awesome when pulled off. Evil Knievel is a game that had potential. The concept is kind of cool. It's sort of a getting over it on wheels, but its insanely jank nature ruins it. So for the difficulty rating, I give Evil Knievel a 7 out of 10 because some of these stages were mad tricky. For its fun factor, I'd say 4 out of 10. Its simple concept, overwhelming difficulty aspect, combined with occasional fun had when I got good, makes it okay. Game number five brings us another frustrating but great experience, Wild Metal from 2000, a Dreamcast port of a 1999 PC game under the name Wild Metal Country, both developed by DMA Design, the previously named Rockstar Origin Company that is now known as Rockstar North. This is my first time playing a Dreamcast and I gotta say, fantastic game, very unique and fun. In typical Rockstar fashion, the game is quite difficult, not too hard, but definitely no walk in the park. Wild Metal is a game where you, as a robot, traverse through three worlds and face off against a wide array of robot enemies, all while you have to find eight colored power cores per mission. There are 24 missions in total which take quite a while to complete. Wild Metal also has a multiplayer mode as well which I didn't try out but looks pretty fun. You have the option of five different tanks which each I tested and realized the Manta is by far the best. Each of the tanks has a fun to use turret weapon with the option of eight ammo types and you also have the 
ability to drop mines. Throughout the maps, there are ammo and health crates dispersed around. The power cores and ammo picked up can be seen in the very cool interface at the bottom of your screen. Also, the type of ammo is displayed on your controller as well, which I thought was super neat. There's helicopters flying around, dropping items, and they can also be called upon to juice your health. They're also designed to help you if you flip your tank or help you if you're in a glitch spot, which I thought that was a unique way to tackle those issues. While you're gathering power cores, you can choose to upload them at the end of the mission at the stores or individually lock them down throughout the mission, which is what I did. The stores can also set you a new checkpoint. This is again a rather obscure game with not much info online about it. It appears not many people played the Dreamcast version, more play the PC. I low-key could be within a handful of people to actually beat this game. No one ever uploads the Dreamcast footage. There's so little online about it that I constantly had to reference the manual, which was pretty informational. Wild Metal is such a trial and error game, you need several times through the maps in order to partially memorize them and get a grip on where items are located. I really dig the sci-fi desolate vibes of the worlds combined with the surprisingly solid physics, but the gameplay is quite repetitive. It does enough to not get boring, but the objectives literally never change. Eight cores to find on each of the 24 missions. That gets very tedious after a while, the pacing drags towards the end, and the planets are honestly just reskins of each other, but like I said, I still do like this game quite a bit. The enemy variety is spectacular. They all look different, they all have different abilities, and can either be shot at or sometimes pushed around. I love the endgame giants, the roller tanks, the really unique magnet grabbers who were a bitch to deal with but really funny when they tossed you across the map. Some enemies even grabbed cores occasionally, which was a pain in the ass but an awesome feature. Some enemies even had cores in them, which confused the hell out of me in the beginning. The longer the game goes, the more and more enemies you go against. Towards the end, you'll straight up be on Keanu mode, dodging shots. I mean, it gets insane. The combat here is sick. The controls are tight, the turret warfare is very well done and satisfying. I wish it was easier to shoot straight. If you don't use the Manta, you won't be able to at all, trust me. The game reminds me of DMA Design's game Body Harvest in a lot of ways. The physics start to have a slight GTA feel too, a little bit of that Rockstar feel I talked about. When flying through the maps, you can flop around, catch some serious air, and slide around on the ice, all which I was shocked to see in such an old game. And I can't pinpoint why exactly, but Wild Metal sort of feels like a board game with the feel of the characters and the objectives. I don't know, I just really enjoyed the unique feel of this game. Wild Metal does have a few negatives, a mini-map was sorely needed, the night missions were brutal to see during, the game doesn't tell you anything at the beginning. You have to figure it out completely yourself. The helicopters were glitchy. I mean, later in the game, they stopped working completely. The level design can occasionally be garbage with its punishing falls and super steep areas. My two biggest complaints are first, I've never been more queasy playing a game. The camera was so trippy at times and I needed breaks because I felt like shit after long playthroughs. And second, the colored radar blips are a terrible system. Very confusing, what meant what and very tricky to follow. If those two things were fixed in particular, it would have been a way better experience. I sort of have a love-hate relationship with Wild Metal, but at the end of the day, it's fun, unique concept outweighs everything else. And like the other games, I was getting good. Bruh, anyone wants to face me split screen, there's no chance you're winning. For Wild Metal's difficulty rating, it was hard, but not impossible. So seven out of 10. For fun factor rating, it's a fat seven out of 10 as well. I look back at it fondly and I've never played anything like it. It has really good replayability. We've officially entered the peak of bizarre Rockstar games with these next two from 2000. First with Austin Powers' O oh Behave, another game developed by Tarantula Studios aka Rockstar Lincoln. I went into this game with low expectations and those expectations were met. The fact this game exists is incredibly confusing to me, I have so many questions. O oh Behave is essentially just a mini game collection while also being a Game Boy computer simulator? A majority of the game is meant to emulate Austin 
Powers computer with the Windows intro, a DOS boot, a calculator, built-in programs, movie clips available to watch, a strange internet portal with pictures of the dev team on it, and overall a ton of customization features. When the mini games are won, you're given prize options, which are just more customization items like backgrounds and in-game sounds weirdly. Now, it's been forever since I've seen an Austin Power movie, so I went and watched the first film, International Man of Mystery, and after that viewing, I gotta say, wow, does this game loosely base its content on the source material, as you'd expect. But at least the game was finally a bit of a breather. It wasn't a super easy game, portions were quite annoying, but a large majority of it was laughably easy. Some of the mini games had difficulty options, so I made sure I played medium for all. There were four mini games in total, with those being Rock, Paper, Scissors, Mojo Maze, Domination, and a platforming game. First starting with Rock, Paper, Scissors, it's exactly that. You play Rock, Paper, Scissors against the villains from the franchise, Fat Bastard, Patty O'Brien, Number 2, Dr. Evil, Frau Frarbishina, Random Task, and a Blackface Wolf Feral as Mufasa. I did enjoy the sprite design of each. They did a pretty good job replicating the actors and actresses. Beating all of them did not take long. It did not require one ounce of skill. It was completely RNG. Next was the Mojo Maze, which in every way copies Pac-Man, the map layout, the items you pick up, the entire concept is a ripoff. There were three stages, each having four mazes to clear. In each maze, you needed to gather every piece of Mojo in order to unlock the next maze. This mini game was stupid. Each maze was the same damn thing. Enemies did look kind of cool, but wow, were they loosely based off the movies. The levels don't scale in difficulty. Health's always in the same area. My strategy for each maze was the same. Hit the border and then use the lightning and grab the middle Mojo. Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Plus, some of the patterns on the maze were a little harsh on the eyes. I mean, look at this. Something cool you'll notice in another Rockstar game of the same era is an Austin Powers Easter egg in GTA London. His classic swinger car is available in that game and can also be seen here. They definitely have some Austin Powers fans over at Rockstar. Anyway, the third game is called Domination. No, not what you're thinking. It's just actually a board game ripoff of Othello. I didn't know how the game was played in the beginning, but eventually got it after a couple of fails. While playing this, I was mad confused what connection, if at all, it had with the Austin Powers franchise. But regardless, it was a tad fun because there was some legit strategy required. Lastly, there's the platforming game called International Man in a Platform Game. Even though this was by far the biggest portion of the game, it's strangely hidden in the menus. Took me a while to find it. It was 25 stages long, which took quite a while to beat. The stages take place in the classic NES era locations, lava level, sewer level, casino level, all unrelated. Every five stages you have to take out a boss, first Fat Bastard, then Blackface Wolf Feral Mufasa who looked like a Simpsons character here, Patty O'Brien, Random Task, and Dr. Evil who are all mad tanky but easy to take out if you spam them on the straightaways. I just think the devs were really grasping at straws for bosses because some of these villains are on screen for such a short amount of time in the movies. There were a few very frustrating moments, especially around the halfway mark. Also, you're not going to be getting any lives back like in Mojo Maze. In this mode, they're very stingy with them. The point of each stage is to collect enough items to raise your mojo to unlock a portal or simply kill the boss if it's a boss battle. There are a wide range of enemies who are all, again, loosely connected to Austin Powers. It's sometimes hard to tell what needs picked up and what needs killed. I mean, is fighting a pillow canon to the Austin Powers universe? I think not. My god, the non-rhythmic enemies were a pain in the ass. I hated those guys. I also realized late into playing the game that you also need to bump into these orange triangles to stop enemies from transforming to even deadlier enemies. I eventually realized it's just easier to avoid most of the enemies instead of killing them. All those little enemies screamed stolen assets. One looked like a fish from Dr. Seuss and I had the wildest theory about one of these little guys. I saw this white globy thing and I thought, damn, kind of looks like this 70s 8-track player I'm trying to buy. Then BAM! When I watched the first film, that's actually what it is. My mind was blown. I did respect in this minigame and the others how there were saves in between the stages so you don't have to redo giant portions. You gotta love that. But at the end of the day, is it a good game? 
God no, another failure from Tarantula Studios. Parts were okay, but overall, the game is mostly not even a game. It's largely just custom computer simulator shit. So for Austin Powers Obehave difficulty rating, it receives a 5 out of 10. Because the domination was tricky and the platforming had hard moments and was super tedious. Fun Factor is going to be an abysmal 2 out of 10. Again, Othello. Oh sorry, Domination little fun and the platformer's simple side-scrolling nature made it somewhat tolerable but overall a sleeper Released the same day as Oh Behave is Austin Powers Welcome to My Evil Lair, a game which I assumed was gonna be a reskin and was 100% correct! Again, from the same studio responsible for Evil Knievel and Oh Behave, Tarantula Studios. Off the bat, if you're wondering why this looks better, I finally realized how to use emulation filters, so sorry about the previous two Game Boy games. Not replaying them though. With Welcome to My Evil Lair, I assumed they were going for a Pokemon alternate version thing where you just choose one, but why? Why? So much shit here doesn't make sense. This is quite literally the definition of a copy and paste game. This time you play each of the mini games from Dr. Evil's perspective. The Mojo Maze is identical besides the last stage, but the thing is gathering Mojo isn't even Dr. Evil's thing. That's more Austin. And at this point I had the enemy patterns perfectly figured out, so I mean it was a walk in the park. The rock, paper, scissors as well, identical. But it makes less sense because you go against villains. Bro, you're a villain. Like, what? Again, had to go against Black Wolf Feral, which I'm still getting used to that. Same domination board game, same computer simulator attempt, same calculator, same internet browser, same ability to watch movie clips, which I guess that's pretty cool, but same programs, same custom features, which I question their existence in the first place. I mean, who cares enough to personalize all this stuff? These two games targeted audiences are so confusing. The games are childish, but the humor is rather adult. The game is rated teen, just contains some clashing vibes. Now for the biggest discovery. And Instead of the platformer, as the fourth minigame, we have, wait for it, Dr. Knievel! Bro! You know what that means. Even more copy and paste. The game is nearly identical to the previously discussed 1990 game Evil Knievel from the same studio. Here, there are 15 stages split between three worlds. This is quite literally the definition of reused assets with absolutely no connection with the films. In the beginning, I was glad to see another motocross game because I got pretty good at Evil Knievel. In the platformer was just too grindy. Also thought it was easier at first. The controls seemed less clunky, checkpoints seemed to be more abundant, and there was less obstacles, head damage seemed to be fixed, and there was less game over screens. But with a little more playing, I took everything back. This was Brutal. Everything I hated from Evil Knievel is here, but low-key worse. The maps are more puzzly this time, and there's actually an objective. You have to find this Meow Mix, and then find the cat Mr. Bigglesworth to give it to. It hit me immediately that this would be impossible, like borderline undoable. What made it so hard was your top-heavy body took damage way easier than Evil Knievel. The maps were also sort of infinite, like in Monster Truck Madness 64. It's hard to explain, but you'll get lost super easy. And the level design purposely points you towards dead ends or the wrong objectives like the pointless gas cans, which looked like the Meow Mix. This time you have an evil meter instead of a health bar, but the number one reason it was harder was the damn flipping mechanic. Barely worked here, spent hours practicing it. And bro, they even brought back the same exact map from Evil Knievel, the hardest one, the first casino level. How insane is that? And you guessed it, it's even harder here. I could go on all day. I mean, I was getting so frustrated. I ended up doing the same thing I did with Evil Knievel where I quick save the hard parts and return to them later. That soon turned into me quick saving through the entire game, which I told myself was fine because without them, it was seemingly impossible. The maps get crazier and crazier. I just cannot stand these games that are designed around trial and air. It seems like a cop-out game design. I felt less guilty using the saves because of the god tier difficulty, but at the same time, it's just so against my nature to cheat. So once I completed the game, I felt slime, so I sat and thought, 
this. I'm beating it old school. I whipped out the Game Boy SP and spent a week cranking back through the game. This is the kind of shit that keeps me up at night, so it needed to happen. I realized that the real handheld version is low-key easier, especially the flipping, significantly improved in that version. I aimed for beating at least a mission a day, and along the way, I took pictures for proof, and once I finished it, the satisfaction hit hard. I challenge anyone to know this game better than I do. It's a weird flex, but one I'm glad to boast about. There's even less info on this game than Obehave, so I really felt on my own. It's possible I'm the only one to actually finish this game, who knows? Welcome to My Evil Lair receives a 9 out of 10 difficulty rating. I think it's pretty clear why. And for the fun factor, it receives a new low of a 1 out of 10. Most of the content is identical to Obehave, and Dr. Knievel had me on suicide watch so just know no fun will be had from austin powers to this a very different game that I'm kind of conflicted on. 2000's Midnight Club Street Racing is a game I wanted to like. It's the start of a now beloved long lasting series, but I gotta say after beating this, not a massive fan. Midnight Club Street Racing was a launch title for the PS2 and was developed by Angel Studios, who interestingly eventually morphed into Rockstar San Diego. That makes total sense because this game totally has that Rockstar feel. I've always considered this game the 3D GTA before 3. Midnight Club is a game where you either play in the arcade mode, which contained several different minigames, or you can play the career mode like I did, which contained 21 required missions. Throughout the game, you race each member of the Midnight Club, who are a group of street racers who only race at midnight. You start off beating three members in New York by racing against them three times each, then you have to go against the New York champ, who was hard. We'll get into that, but once you beat him, the second half of the game takes place in London, where you defeat three more members, defeat the London champ, and then the world champ. Midnight Club adds a lot of elements to differentiate itself from other racers. Some are commendable, but most are annoying. One of those being every course taking place in the dark, which I get it, it's the name of the game, but it makes you run into stuff way easier. Also, with it being street racing, there's a scripted traffic and police element that needs to be avoided. Another being how the races are laid out. Checkpoints will either be laid out in a linear way or in a scattered way, which is meant to force the player to discover the best way to connect the dots. During the scattered checkpoint races, the best strategy was to just trial and error follow bots until one eventually blazes the correct trail. Along the way, you unlock some cars, but in order to get more and more advanced versions of each, you have to use the cell phone to go head to head with each each member to receive their vehicles. I did a little of this, but you only really need to get one car with a decent bit of nitrous, which is a boost feature that is required for the later races. Now this game doesn't tell you much at all. You have to figure out most gameplay aspects just by playing. How to unlock a car, when to upgrade to nitrous, and how to even start a mission are not clear. I eventually got a grasp on how everything worked, but it took a while. In a game like this, you'd assume going from race to race is pretty simple. How would you be wrong? Midnight Club has this feature where in order to start a race, you have to find and follow each member closely for a certain amount of time, which can be very difficult. That could be a game in and of itself. That aspect added so much time to complete. And originally, I thought it was kind of a cool idea, but later game, it's a grindy chore. The game starts you off needing to follow a member, which took me a while to even realize. And man, when it comes to the champs, especially New York's, my god. God is it impossible to follow him. I'm talking really goddamn hard. Honestly, that whole element of the game kind of ruins it. It destroys the pacing. Like I said, I went in positive, but just ended up getting frustrated the entire time. The physics, very strange feeling. The AI, very often buggy. The lighting, even though it's midnight, not the best. The NPC vehicles, very spastic and very confusing driving patterns. The game crashed on me four times. The overall vehicle 
vehicle handling is very jank feeling. Little ice rinky and the drift is way too immediate. That took me a minute to master. But my number one gripe is the feeling of the actual racing. There's an overwhelming feeling of unfairness. Your acceleration compared to every other car is a joke. The way other cars speed up is so unbalanced here. You are such at a disadvantage. So often, the only way you can win is if the first place guy glitches out or randomly crashes. There's not really a satisfying feeling when you win because it just feels like the game let you. If you keep retrying the same race over and over, it feels like they also dumbed down the AI, which just makes you feel pointless. The enemy cars are of course very scripted, and it's hard to get them off of their on-rail cutscene-esque driving. There's usually zero room for mess ups. I'm talking one street lamp, and it's game! You'll be constantly restarting. A feeling I had non-stop was, do I restart because I screwed up or do I stay and let the race play out in case one of the bots screws up? It's unpredictability just made it an exhausting playthrough. This is honestly some of the most sweaty gameplay I've ever produced. It got to such a point, I literally even had the AC on in December. By far the hardest portion of the game is beating the New York champ or just honestly following him. Like I said, God, I was getting frustrated. The point of the game where you get a nitrous car it gets substantially easier but before that it's brutal midnight club wasn't terrible by any means i enjoyed customizing the cars i really appreciated the changeable mini map the replay feature was fun to watch the smugglers run nod was dope i respect how generous the checkpoint ranges were and lastly the idea of plotting your route and seeing what works and what doesn't is clever when loading in you have to analyze the dots and form a game plan which that was fun plus the other bots choose different routes and crossing paths with them was awesome a point i realized during this that i want to make clear is since I'm completing these in the fastest time possible to make this video, that leads me to get a little extra frustrated and complainy, so take some of what I say with a grain of salt. I am spitting facts most of the time though. So for Midnight Club's difficulty rating, I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. I've played harder, but the feeling of the driving, especially the acceleration, leads to non-stop rage. For the fun factor, I'd give Midnight Club Street Racing a 5 out of 10. The core concept is cool and the way they shake up the typical racer formula is respectable and at times you do feel like you're in a fast and furious movie but too sweaty too sweaty and i can't say i'm too excited for the several midnight club games coming up Released a single day after Midnight Club, or the day before? Depends on the source, is Smuggler's Run. A banger of a game. One I've been hyped to play because the multiplayer split screen is spectacular. It's a super fun couch co-op experience that got me excited to play the story mode, which also ended up being a blast. This is again another game with not much online about it. I personally think it's very underrated. Smuggler's Run is another PS2 launch title and was also developed by the same people behind Midnight Club, Angel Studios, aka Rockstar San Diego. This game also saw a release in Japan a year later under the name Crazy Bumps and in 2002 for the Game Boy Advance. Also fun fact, to pay homage, GTA Online released DLC titled Smuggler's Run. I love Smuggler's Run concept for a game. It's super unique. Throughout the 34 missions, there's several different types of objectives ranging from grabbing and delivering three to five packages, destroying towers, snagging packages from rival gangs, racing or battling it out in turf wars. Each is pretty similar, you drive towards your goal while avoiding cops, border patrol, and the CIA, and avoiding taking too much damage. Occasionally you will take enough damage and your car will stall and you can either restart the engine or if you're not quick enough, you'll get arrested. Throughout the game you start to unlock more and more vehicles, but I found myself only using the god tier SUV, nothing really compared to it. So much about Smuggler's Run is great. It's super fun, driving crazy fast in these giant open sandboxy feeling maps with very very solid feeling controls. Throughout the story you play in three maps, forest, desert, and snow, which the snow map is just the first map reskinned and it's more slippery. The game really gets a lot of mileage out of those three because each mission only takes place in a small chunk of each map, which always felt new. During the fast paced missions you'll be catching crazy air off hills, flying through tunnels, sliding around on the ice, grabbing money, DNA, gems, and kidneys. 
it's awesome. This is definitely a game with that Rockstar feel with the driving physics, cop chasing and the humor and story, the pedestrian and animal hitting. That led to a ton of hilarious moments. The variety of animals to hit here had me dying. Even the map gave me wild metal vibes as well. There's even a mission called Red or Dead, which is a foreshadow maybe? I don't mean to dick ride, but everything about Smuggler's Run is fantastic. The damage system is done correctly. The mini map overlay is easy to use and helpful. The soundtrack slaps and the number one best thing about it is the simplicity. It's always obvious where to go. Checkpoints are very clearly marked. It's never complicated. I just love how it goes from point A to B and you choose whatever route you want in between. There's a super quick restart feature that honestly every game needs and those all add to a really nice relaxing playthrough for the most part. Smuggler's Run had its hard portions, 100%. Around the 10 mission mark, the difficulty takes a leap. Not too much, but enough to make you pay more attention. The time limits get slimmer, and the cops get way more aggressive the farther you progress through the story. It's a very momentum-based game. There's very little room for error. One slip up in the crazy ass AI jumps on your ass. The AI is some of the smartest I've ever dealt with. It impressed me, but also pissed me off. During the desert portion of the game, it was way easier to dodge the cops, but still one flip and it's game. The police get so fast and they'll drive right under you sometimes. Especially the 11th, 26th, and 33rd missions will kick your ass guaranteed. I really started going goat mode at the end when I realized that you have to hug the ground. It's really the only way to pass some missions. And things got way easier when 30 missions in, I realized there was a handbrake slash air stabilizer button. Could have used that earlier. Smuggler's Run really shines in the five package delivery turf wars where you choose teammates. Very, very fun. Your boys will occasionally hit you for zero reason, but when the team works together, it's something special. I really don't have many negatives. The three package delivery missions happened the most and they got a little old. Some of the arrests are bullshit and the flipping mechanic didn't work the best. The last several missions are more sweat than fun, but overall, I look back at the game fondly. The maps can be unrelenting. The cops can be major slime balls. The time frames can be brutal, but everything adds up to a game of perfect difficulty. Honestly, if I didn't have the hours spent in split screen, it would have taken me longer because I came in with a bit of prior experience. Smuggler's Run is a game I'd heavily recommend. I can't wait to play the second. The difficulty rating here, I'd say a 7 out of 10. Most of the game is doable besides the missions 11, 26, and 33, like I said. Fun Factor is a whopping 9 out of 10. Really unique experience that many sleep on, but hopefully once you see this, you'll check it out. Bro. I didn't think it could get harder than Earthworm Jim and Dr. Knievel. When you combine their difficulty together, you get Surfing H3O from 2000. A doozy of a game. Maybe the hardest I've ever played. Similar to earlier games, Surfing H3O is said to have released the same day as Midnight Club and Smuggler's Run. It appears Rockstar had a really weird release schedule back in the day. Now, I was real excited to see this weird ass game up next. These oddball Rockstar titles are some of the games I anticipate playing the most. The game was originally released in Japan two months before the US under the name Surfroid. Both Surfroid and Surfing H3O are developed by Opus Corp, a Japanese developer that appears to still be active. Surfing H3O starts off with the same Rockstar intro as the past PS2 games and is the fourth game to include a live action intro as well, which I've always thought is a cool Rockstar trademark. The game consists of two modes, tournament and versus mode. Versus mode is the same thing as tournament, you just pass the controller to a friend as if it was multiplayer. Tournament is what I played and beat for this video. The mode is just a series of waves you need to surf all while collecting the points needed to pass. Each time you get through the tournament it allows you to raise the difficulty and play them all again with higher point requirements it starts you on normal but there is an easy mode beyond normal there's semi pro pro extreme and master once each difficulty is beaten you unlock new boards characters and sometimes stages we'll get into that aspect of the game but there's more setup there are 30 boards and 11 playable characters in total. One of the very few things I did like were those characters. On the outside, the game has a generic look, but the characters 
characters here are insane. I loved the wild alien designs. There's a shark human hybrid, a sort of troll, a weird bird, a turtle, and a super cool looking alien that's actually named the same thing as the Japanese game, Surfroid. The whole game has extreme arcade vibes with the character select, the choose to continue live system, and the gimmicky controls. Those gimmicky controls are some of the hardest I've ever dealt with. What they were going for is extremely commendable and unique. You use each joystick together as if it were a surfboard that required steering and balancing. I doubt this game invented that idea, but I thought it was a really cool way to control a sports game in a way that feels realistic. Plus, there aren't many surfing games in general, so I respect its existence in the first place. Something I discovered that is beyond cool is the Japanese version of this game came with a clip-on surfboard for your joysticks. How dope is that? I have to own one. Honestly, it probably would have helped for this playthrough. Even though I respect the gimmicky controls, they're executed terribly. You thought the Monster Truck Madness 64 rant was bad? Well, prepare for what I gotta say about this piece of trash. Let me break down why Surfing H3O is a game of god tier difficulty. When you start off, they play you a tutorial in order for you to learn how the controls work, and wow does it do a bad job at that. The tutorial is the only help the game gives you, no control or tricks menu like in Thrasher, and the moment I saw tricks were back, it immediately caused PTSD flashbacks from the hours spent grinding on skate and destroy thank god there weren't as many tricks in this game more were unlocked via characters who each had unique tricks but nothing compared to thrasher that lack of help made me whip out the manual during every playthrough in order to take advantage of the little assistance it provided like many of the games discussed today there's almost nothing online about it so i had to resort to old school methods besides the extremely frustrating arcade style live system confusing surfer stats and less than stellar characters Camera, what ultimately caused the most rage was the goddamn controls. Surfing H3O is jaw-droppingly hard. For the life of me, I could not get the weird joystick mechanic down. Not only is it borderline impossible to reach the score limits, it's hard enough staying on your damn board. In order to do tricks to gain points, the planets needed to align. First of all, getting the speed required was so hard. The way the tutorial tells you to is blatantly wrong. Knowing how to execute the tricks and where you can execute them takes mad practice. When I started on normal, you just had to reach 200 points, which actually can be accomplished without doing any tricks. Instead of tricks, points can be gained through these colored buoys. So after hours and hours of grinding, I eventually was able to crank through the first tournament by purely grabbing the buoys for points. After that, the credits rolled, which that had me excited to see, but then when I saw a pop-up box telling me what I unlocked, including an additional stage, my excitement was extinguished. That made me think I need to beat every difficulty in order to play every stage, which was my beginning goal. Once the depression wore off, I got my shit together and attempted beating the rest of the game. I spent days trying to beat the tournament on semi-pro. It was some of the most toxic I've ever been in a game. Like Earthworm Jim 3D, this was another low point in my life. I was constantly debating whether beating it on normal was acceptable, but I just couldn't convince myself I needed to finish it through to beat all the levels. I eventually got to that new unlocked stage and it took place on the moon strangely. The stage's design along with all the others was aesthetically pleasing, but what the game didn't clearly tell me was the score limit was lowered on this new level, which if I knew, I would have avoided attempting tricks, which are impossible on some maps. I was under the impression tricks were required for semi pros 250 point requirement, but what stages allowed for them was always a toss up. I was honestly losing my mind. Every time I would struggle on the first impossible wave, every time the wave switched, I'd immediately choke. I even went backwards to easy mode to practice. I told myself, just get to the end of semi pro and make sure there aren't any new stages. Once they stop getting unlocked, I'll stop. Very long story short, I realized that you could play through the six stages by only grabbing the buoys again, but you needed to get them in a particular order for bonus points. I perfected that strategy and eventually passed the semi-pro tournament. Then I sat through the second set of credits and anxiously waited to see if a new stage got unlocked and nope. 
that was it. The rest of the game was purely character unlocks. That nearly brought me to tears. I was overjoyed with the fact that I actually beat the game. And to make it even better, I looked deep online to prove that the difficulties of Pro, Extreme, and Master did not contain a new stage. And once I came across a website for the Japanese version confirming, yes, there are only six stages, let's go. I never got to use the bird, turtle, or alien, but I wasn't about to go through that extra effort. Just in case you as a viewer want to get this super cheap game and play it because you're also a completionist, I'll lay out the seven things I wish I knew because, like I said, there's almost no info on this game. Number one, finishing the stage gives you 120 points. The game does not tell you that though. All you need to do is accumulate 130 points and finish the wave to gain that extra 120 on the semi-pro difficulty. Number Number two, it looks like the finish line ends sometimes. Nope, you can still finish. Also, don't worry about the time limit. It's never a concern. Three, the best way to gain speed is either by finding the wave sweet spot and cruising or doing a subtle pumping motion. Also, you can use the ripstick strategy I came up with where you pump like crazy. That sometimes worked. Number four, only gather buoys and gather them in the order of blue, green, and red for bonus points. If you happen to miss a few, risk attempting a trick only at the end as a last ditch effort. Number five, in order to pull off a trick, you need to have the speed bar in the green yellow area, be substantially in front of the wave's break, and then hit the ramp perfectly straight on. Then mash your bumpers and triggers and joysticks to spin to pull off whatever trick, doesn't really matter. And the landing is important. You wouldn't think so, but you need to either end nose down or butt down in order to not wipe out. Number six, if you end a trick and you need a little bit more points, make your way back to the tube and carefully snap your last couple points by slightly entering it. And number seven, lastly, reset your console if you ever use a continue on the first two waves because you'll need to save them up for the last four. So that about does it for Surfing H3O. I've never played a game like this and I never want to again. I bet money that learning how to actually surf is way easier than this brutally unfair god tier hard game. Surfing H3O's difficulty rating goes without saying 10 out of 10. It's fun factor, I give the game a 3 out of 10 purely for the gimmicky controls that if fixed could really be something. BAM! First 10 completed. Now I know this isn't probably what you're thinking when it comes to Rockstar games, but these are in fact the first 10 published games. Despite this batch lacking that Rockstar feel and containing a few duds, there was some heat. Even though there was some fire, pretty much all of these games were hard as hell, but with the hours that it took me to beat all of these games, I was getting pretty good at the end if I say so myself. I hope I brought some of these more obscure games to light because there's so little information on several of these online. One of the reasons I'm making this series is to address the modern day Rockstar hate. This video isn't a great example, but as the series continues, you will soon realize the amazing forgotten back catalog of the now uber popular game studio. Fans nowadays give them major flack for their slow release schedule, lack of variety, and lack of experimentation with new IPs, but come on, look at the classics they've produced. Name a company with a better track record of incredible, dense, fun, polished, detail-laden, long-lasting games. I just think people need to calm down, step back, play the older titles, and respect their greatness. Anyway, stay tuned for part two, where we start to get into games with that rockstar feel that we all crave. Mm -hmm.